All right, everybody, let's get started. You're here today for your Harvey, Harvey Cleary, Job Site General Safety Orientation. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Lester Madare, Senior Safety Manager for the Mid-Atlantic Region. I've been with the company for over 10 years. If you ever have any questions, comments, complaints, get my number, give me a call. We'll be glad to jump in and help you out, get you a good explanation of what's going on, or see what's different that you might not know that you need a little knowledge on. We're here for you. Okay, hi, I'm David Harvey. I'm with Harvey, Harvey Cleary. I wanna welcome you to our project. We have at Harvey a culture here in a program that we are extremely proud of when it comes to work and safety. We've worked very hard over decades to achieve what we believe is a world-class reputation as a great builder with safe results. Your role, we expect you to be involved in keeping your workplace safe. We believe and practice something we call behavior-based safety. The idea is for you to think safety always on the job and even at home. We expect you to participate in training that we offer or your employer offers, especially as it applies to safe operation of equipment and tools. We also expect that you'll be trained in hazard recognition, safe handling of materials, and the dangers of inhaling or ingesting toxic chemicals. We want you to learn safe body mechanics while lifting. We want you to be aware of falling and fall protection of stairs, ladders, and proper scaffolding. We hope that you will be trained in electrical shock hazards, including cords and ground fault interrupters, we call GFIs. And lastly, any hazards associated with excavating and shoring. You will be issued by your employer or at Harvey PPE, personal protective equipment. And we expect you to, number one, wear this product uh, to protect you and number two, allow it to serve as a constant symbol of your heightened awareness while you're always on a dangerous job site. As far as safety is concerned, your attitude and your awareness are the most important. It's an attitude toward working safely and recalling this training that I just referenced that will keep you safe from your injuries each day. Your PPE, your hat, gloves, and boots and vest will be your constant reminder. All of this matters, and we want you to return home to your family at the end of each day from work safely. We can only achieve this with your full commitment in our world-class safety program and the consistent culture that we practice to avoid mistakes and accidents. Finally, you'll be asked to attend and participate in a JSA, the Job Site Safety Analysis, each morning and after lunch. This is mandatory on all Harvey projects. Thank you for joining our team and welcome to our construction family. Okay, everyone in the company has stop work authority. It doesn't matter who you are. If you see something that's not right, just ask everybody to stop. Let's double check it. We'll get our superintendent over. We'll make sure, yes, they're doing it right. No, they're not. We need to make some changes. But again, everyone has stop work authority on any project of a Harvey, Harvey Cleary nature at any time. If you're new to a project, you're going to, have to go through a project orientation similar to the one that we're doing now. You must go through orientation before you start any type of work on a project. After orientation, you'll receive a number that identifies that you've been through orientation and you understand our safety expectations and what's required of you while you're working on our project. While on our project, a competent person must be on site at all times. Your foreman, it could be a sub foreman, but it needs to be a competent person while you're working and they must be able to understand and speak English while they're on our projects. No firearms, weapons, drugs, alcohol, or fighting allowed on any of our sites at any time. No radios, boom boxes, earbuds of any kind, playing music are allowed. No whistling or cat calling the workers on the job site or pedestrians. If you're caught, you'll be removed from the job site. 
Each individual working on this project may be subject to a random, for cause, or reasonable suspicion drug and alcohol screening. Any individual that submits a non-negative or presumed positive drug screen will be removed from the project until certified by a laboratory. Any individual that refuses to submit a drug and alcohol screen will be removed immediately from the project. All workers on the job site will attend a JSA meeting every morning before beginning work of any type. All workers must sign an initial a JSA after that meeting and before any work begins. All workers will again initial the after lunch JSA noting they attended that meeting and any revision scope changes were addressed and communicated. So here's how your day is going to begin. On a Harvey Cleary project, we read the JSA in the morning. We get input from anyone who wants to make any changes or something we may have forgotten on the JSA. We do a stretch and flex routine. Everyone signs the JSA. Then we go to work. After lunch, after break, we come back, we refocus on safety, make sure there's no changes, any scope of the work hasn't been changed. We all reinitial the JSA again, then it goes on the JSA board for the day. We go continue our work until it's time to go home. All accidents, injuries must be reported immediately and before leaving the job site to Harvey Cleary. We want to know anything from a major scratch to a cut. We want to be there to help you manage it. We have some first aid supplies in the office if need be. We can bandage you up, put some Neosporin on there. We want to make sure it doesn't get infected and that everything goes well until you're healed up. As far as housekeeping goes, all workers will clean up on a daily basis. A clean project makes for a safe project. Aisles and passageways must be kept clear of debris. Entrances and exits must be free of obstructions. In the event we have to evacuate the building or the property, we want a safe way out for everybody to go at one time. We don't want to be climbing over material, going around debris. It needs to be safe and open for us to get off the projects. Floor sweeping compound or wet method must be used to control dust. So here you see there's two kinds of floor sweeping compound. One's a wax based, one's an oil based. Before you go sweeping the floors, Ask the job site superintendent what type of finish is going on the floor. Depending on what finishes we put down is what floor sweep we use. If you choose to use water and a pump sprayer, that's fine. Spray down a light mist, sweep up. We just don't want any silica dust, any airborne contaminants floating around on a job site as we're moving around and as we're working. Okay, nails, screws from scrap material must be removed or bent over to prevent impalement. Our policy is if you break a board loose and there's a nail sticking out, it gets bent over. Everything gets either pulled out and removed or bent immediately. Safety data sheets are given to Harvey Cleary for all chemicals. All safety data sheets shall be on site and available where the chemicals are being used. If you notice right over here in the corner on this shelf is all the safety data sheets for this job. Each subcontractor sub supports a book for safety data sheets training records, and their safety manual. They're all over there on the shelf. At any time, if you're working with any chemical, come on and feel free to get a copy. Use that for your toolbox talk, but make sure you read that before you're involved with using these chemicals on these projects. Okay, all containers containing the chemicals must be labeled clearly. Empty containers shall be disposed of in their proper trash container according to the SDS. Unused chemicals or liquids must be removed by the site contractor. We see this a lot on our projects. Cut off Gatorade bottles, uh, plain paint cans from Home Depot. They're not allowed. It has to actually be in the manufacturer can that it comes from the factory with an approved decal stuck on the side of it. Okay. Personal protection equipment. Hard hats must be worn correctly at all times. We've always seen people with their hats turned around backwards. There's different kind of hard hats. Some are designed to be worn backwards, some are not. So let's make sure we all have the bill facing forward. Safety glasses 
Rated Z87 with side shields must be worn properly at all times. So we see a lot of people with prescription glasses. These are not true safety glasses. You actually have to either have the safety glasses from the manufacturer or if you go to a, a Walmart or Costco or Target, you can actually order Z87 construction glasses with come with the proper side shields on a built onto them. If you come on a project with a prescription glass, it's not a true glass. We're going to ask you to wear an over glass over the top of it or safety goggles over the top until you can go to the store and get some proper safety glasses. Work boots are sturdy. Hard sole shoes are required. No sandals or tennis shoes are allowed. Proper work clothing is to be worn. Shorts or tank top tile sleeveless shirts are not permitted. Pants, jeans with holes or openings are not allowed. We don't want anything like this. There's a chance you could brush up against some debris, some bad housekeeping, a metal stud. We don't want you to cut your leg as you're walking by. We want you to be dressed proper. You want to have good pants, high reflective vest, hard hat, safety glasses. If you're in a dusty environment and your company requires you to wear respirators, that's where you'll wear that. And you should have gloves with you at all times. It's a requirement for Harvey Cleary to have gloves on your possession at all times on our projects. Okay, gloves are required for all crafts when handling sharp or pointed materials. Using hand tools where the likelihood of injury can occur. Or where the safety of the worker will be enhanced. Gloves again are required to be within the reach of the worker at all times during the performance of work. There's many types of gloves out there. We want you to use something where you have the good dexterity where you can actually work and do what you need to do. Okay, respirator equipment is to be used when required by the safety data sheets or working when conditions require it. We'll do what we call a high hazard JSA. If there's any time that you're gonna need a respirator of any type, we're gonna review the safety data sheet. We're gonna sit down with your crew and your office and we're gonna decide what's the right protection for you to have. And in return, they'll have to get you trained to wear a respirator. They'll have you fit tested and they'll make sure that you have the right equipment and it's clean while you're on the job site. Hearing protection is required when noise level decibels is 90 dB or higher. There's a lot of meters we walk around with. We make sure that if it's really noisy in the environment you're working on, not only will you have to wear hearing protection, but everybody else in the area who's close by or within that 90 decibel range. Full arm protection must be worn when the hazards exist and working above the ceiling grid. Full arm protection must be worn when installing light fixtures in the ceiling grid. Full arm protection must be worn when handling any type of glass. Okay, normal day to day to work on our projects, we wear these full, long Kevlar or Dyneema type sleeves. If you're working with glass or mirrors, that can shear off and have long, sharp points and edges, we're gonna ask you to wear a glass type sleeve. These are kind of resembles what they call gauntlet sleeves. Any questions? So remember, full arm protection when the hazards exist. If there's a chance you can get cut, you're hauling garbage, any type of debris, metal sticking out of cans, we want you to have your full arm protection. Okay. Signs and barricades. Barricades such as leading edges, warning lines, hand lines on the edge of an elevation six feet or higher are not to be crossed without proper fall protection. Any barricade tape must be tagged with a contractor, foreman name, and phone number and shall never be crossed. So the first one goes to, if you walk up to a leading edge, an elevator shaft, a stairway, something that's not right, you, you should not even be close to those. You should be with at least six feet back and they should be marked. If you get close to those, you need to have the proper fall protection. We also like to see tags on our barricades. We wanna know who put them on, what subcontractor, what's that foreman's name. And it's also good for you because you need to work in that area or you may need to pass through. You could give them a call and find out what hazards are around. So you can either A, go work in another location or you'll be able to go through that barricade and pass on to the other side. So make sure that we have tags on all of our barricades. Okay. 
when barriers such as danger or caution tape or arm fencing to be crossed only after communicating with the foreman in charge of the work of that barrier. This is where it goes back to this tag comes in really handy. If you come up on some red danger tape and your crew needs to get in there, you need to get some of your material that's behind it, give them a call, ask them, hey, how much long are you gonna be working? I need to get in this area. Can you come escort me in and escort me out so I can stay out of your work area? Barricade tape must be removed when the dangerous or hazardous task is complete. All signs must be observed and followed. So what we find a lot of times is a crew comes in for one day, they put up the tape and they leave. We don't know why it's there. Is there still a hazard existing or are they finished and just didn't pick up their materials? So what we wanna do is clean this up. When you're finished the job, you're finished your housekeeping, it's all tidied up, get in touch with the job site superintendent and say, hey, Mr. Superintendent, we're finished. We picked up all of our tape. You don't even know we were there. It's so clean in that area. Okay, fire protection. Fire extinguishers must have the following components. A seal holding the pin, the pin preventing the extinguisher from being discharged, an annual inspection tag, by a third party company, a cylinder must be in good condition. We wanna make sure there's no rust, no dents, no dings. A lot of times these fall over and the handle gets bent on the top and they're inoperable. You wanna look at the tag and make sure that it's fully charged and in a green location. We have extinguishers at each stairway. When the job gets really going, we'll have extinguishers placed throughout the property. You should have fire extinguishers if you're going to create any kind of fire or any kind of hazard. You should have your own fire extinguishers. If you see ours or anyone else's is damaged, rusted, no tag, no pin, the, the indicator's not in the green zone, get with somebody from the Harvey Cleary team and we'll get that replaced or we'll get with that sub and have them replace that extinguisher. Okay, fire extinguishers must be in, within 10 feet of all flames. If we have a welder, somebody with a cutting torch, somebody cutting metal studs with a chop saw, they want to have their own fire extinguisher close by. Now, whenever we create a spark, we also have hot work permits. Our hot work permits are in the superintendent's office. Your foreman will fill this out. He'll double check all his information. He'll get with the superintendent, the superintendent and the safety guy or the superintendent and your foreman will go out to that work area and we'll double check to make sure that whatever sparks you're creating or any fire that may take place can be contained and not endanger anybody else on the project. The hot work permit is two parts. One part stays in the office with your JSA. The other part is on your cart or in your work area as you're working. The hot work permit is only good for one day. They must be renew renewed daily. Okay, no operating cell phones while we're on equipment. We all see the dangers when we drive back and forth to work. We definitely don't need any problems on our job site. So again, no cell phones. If you're driving a forklift and your cell phone goes off or you need to talk to somebody, leave it in your pocket, put the machine in neutral, turn the engine off, set the parking brake, <coughs> and then go ahead and make your call or answer your telephone call. Okay. All equipment must be inspected daily. We wanna make sure that we don't have any damage hammers out that way. We wanna make sure that any uh, pipe bending equipment is in good condition. All our ladders have all the labels that are needed and required. On an extension ladder, we wanna make sure it has the pull rope to extend it up and down. Double check that ladder to make sure that it doesn't have any cracks or breaks in the fiberglass. If it's not a good bright orange color, like when it came from the factory and it's starting to get to a faded pink, we probably wanna swap that ladder out. It's at the end of its use cycle, we say, and there's a good chance that that fiberglass is just gonna break and shatter and you're gonna fall off of it. So make sure you have good ladders. Inspect the ladder too each time you get on it. You may go to break, you may go to the restroom, you may go to lunch, and when you come back, what if somebody used your ladder and damaged it? So again, if you leave for a, your if you leave your work area and come back, make sure that you double check your ladder that it's still in the same condition and is good for you to use. Okay, we're getting into excavations now. All excavations must be inspected daily, barricaded, and protect workers from falling. So we want to check our barricades daily. We have a lot of different weather conditions over here. We got rain, 
We might have a little bit of uh, overflow from a pump. There's, there's different conditions. So we, as our barricades are inspected, you'll make sure that they're right to go in. You don't want to get too close to them either. We want to make sure that we follow the standards on how far back our railing should be. And a Harvey requirement is that we have orange snow fencing. This keeps debris from blowing down in the hole. If you're down in that excavation and working, nothing can roll in and fall in as the wind blows it down. All excavations five feet or more must be sloped, bent, shored, and monitored for air quality. We also require that there's an air monitor that goes in there. They call them seven gas meters. We put them down in a hole because, yes, it's a new hole that we're digging, but we don't know what's underground. We don't know what contaminants are, are following through breaks in the earth as they move down from one end to the other. So we want to make sure that nobody gets uh, inhales any bad chemicals or anything dangerous while they're in these holes. All right, excavations must have a ladder for access within 25 feet of the work area. So when you're in this excavation, within 25 feet of where you're working should be a ladder for you to get out of that excavation in the event something's not right. All holes that are two inches and larger must be covered and clearly marked whole. All holes must be able to withstand two times the weight of any material or equipment that may potentially roll over the hole. If a person's walking over this hole, it should hold 200 pounds. If you plan on driving a scissors lift over this, it needs to hold at least 10,000 pounds. So we, we wanna make sure that whatever we're doing, our holes are marked and covered, and they also will withstand two times the weight of any load that's gonna be put on them. On a scissors lift now, if you're traveling horizontal, the standards have changed on this. If you're going horizontal, what we want to do is make sure that you're tethered, which is usually about a three foot dog leash type piece of equipment. In the event that you hit a pothole or a bad spot, you won't get thrown out of the machine. You'll be with inside the confines of the basket as you're rolling along. If you're going vertical, then you don't need to be tied off. This is where the standard has changed. If you're going up and down, no fall protection, nothing required, but we still want you to have your harness on because you do still have to move that lift horizontally across the ground to get to the location you're gonna be working. Never climb on the mid rails or any handrails. Never reach outside the handrail system to the point you could fall out and fall over. Never tie off to the lift when outside of the lift. We never want to do this. The hydraulics could break, the spring could break, the machine may malfunction and pull you off of, of where you're working. Okay, we're gonna get into ladders and stilts now. We always want to inspect our ladders before use. As we put them up for the night, they're safe. The next morning before we use them, we want to go through and inspect them. Never stand on the top two steps of any ladder or any extension ladder, it's not permitted. We also don't allow any aluminum ladders on our Harvey Cleary projects. This is, this is a no-no, and this is definitely a no-no here. You, you, your center of balance should be where your waist is. This is a good example right here. You can, you can use the ladder to kind of lean up against. He's kind of getting to the part of where he's twisted a little further than what he should be. He actually should come down and turn that ladder and get it faced in a different direction. But again, we don't want anybody on the top two steps and we want your waist to kind of fit on that top cap of that ladder to give you that good balance momentum. Full foot ladders are not allowed on our job site. All the ladders we want to need to be five foot or taller and always use the correct size ladder. If you have a ladder this short, you're gonna be on the top two steps and it's not allowed and you're just not gonna have the proper use out of that ladder we should get. Do not use ladder stilts or rolling scaffold on an unstable floor or surface that is in need of housekeeping where a slip, trip, and fall. If you're on a scaffold or baker scaffold like this, before it gets moved, you actually have to come down on the ground, unlock all four of your wheels and move it. We don't allow anyone to be on a scaffold and have somebody push you down the work area as you go along. You should also have a ground person that's cleaning up any debris, sweeping, cleaning, make sure that, that when you come down off that scaffold, you've got a good clear path to move your scaffold along the wall as you're working. 
Okay, a spider or ground person is required if you're working on stilts. They want to assist you in handing you material, keeping the floor clean, and making sure that you're not going to fall off of those stilts. Here, we've got a little bit of house cleaning for this gentleman that's working. We probably could clean it up, but it's still got a good work area for him to get around. One of the things that we really don't think about is when we put our stilts on. If you go back to the manufacturer, you're not supposed to lean up against the wall. You're not supposed to lean up against the ladder. You should have some kind of platform. Either they build you a wooden box to sit on so it's comfortable for you to put your stilts on, or you use a baker scaffold with the platform set at the right height where you can put your stilts on. This is the only correct way to put your stilts on. All scaffolds must be tagged and dated before each shift by a competent person. All scaffolds should have handrails on a minimum of three sides with mid rails, tow boards where appropriate. These are usually built in by the manufacturer. Scaffold building and dismantling require fall protection when the worker is exposed to a fall. So if they're assembling or disassembling a scaffold, that's a whole different JSA that we're going to fill out and we're going to take a look at. But here we got a basic scaffold, the Baker scaffold with only one section. He'll have his green tag he'll put on here and they'll also tag these scaffolds. All right, fall protection. Personal fall protection is required for those working in an area where a fall of six feet or more is possible. So if you're anywhere near an open fall area, we need to make sure that you have a retractable rope lifeline, something hooked to your harness and your harness is fitting correctly. Anyone working on an elevated platform such as a boom lift are required to have personal fall protection and tied to the anchorage point designated by the manufacturer. This gentleman here has a short SRL retractable type lanyard which is good. It'll keep him inside of this basket is where he needs to be. If you see somebody working in one of these that has a big six foot lanyard hanging loose, the odds are that if that machine acts up and throws him out, he's going to be hanging on the outside. The object is, is to keep you inside of that basket while you're working and if anything goes wrong. Here, these guys are hooked to the proper anchorage point. It's hard to tell in the picture, but they actually have the short what I call the three foot dog leash. It keeps them in that basket. They're not allowed to step on this handrail. They're not allowed to top, step on the top handrail. They have to work within the confines of the basket. Workers that are performing leading edge work or subject to a fall must be 100% tied off. A leading edge retractable must be used when the worker is tied off below his shoulder or working on a leading edge. So there's actually two kinds of retractables out that way. There's a standard one and there's a leading edge one. So when you go to do your work, you're going to fill out your JSA. This is going to come into what we call a high hazard type of JSA. We're going to review it with the Harvey team. And then when you pick your retractable up, it'll actually say leading edge retractable for what you're using. So just to kind of go back a little bit, this gentleman, if he's tied off below his feet, will need a leading edge retractable. If you're over the edge of a concrete slab or something that could cut the normal retractable, they need to be leading edge style. And actually it's, it's marked on all of the retractables. The retractables also need to have a proper tag on them. It can't be painted over, scratched up, torn out, wore out. We wanted to make sure that it's in good readable condition. That's a requirement by the OSHA standards. Moving into our electrical section, lockout tagout will take place at the source of the power. In the event of an electric panel must be locked out, a locking device must be used in accordance with OSHA and NFPA 70E standards. We all know what OSHA stands for. NFPA is National Fire Protection Act. 70E is the electrical standard. On a Harvey Cleary project, all our electricians will have a lockout tagout system. They'll also put a tag with a lock and they'll have the name of the person who put it on there, his phone number, what company he's working for, and the date and the time. Nobody is allowed to take that lock off at any time except for the person who installed that lock. 
If multiple people need to work on a piece of equipment, we're going to have one of these larger six hole type devices where you could have different locks from each person. And again, until each tag is removed off of that, each lock and tag is removed off of this lockout, we are not turning that piece of equipment back on. Any questions on that one? All right, let's move on. All wire ends are to be taped unless they are hot and energized. At that time, they need to have the correct size wire nuts installed. Energized wires will be coiled up and placed inside the junction box and covered with a cover. All BX cable ends must be taped and capped and secured. So let's start with this one. This is your BX MC type cable. We get a lot of people cut. They, they wrap these up and hang them in the ceiling and they fall down and there's really sharp edges on here. So as the electrician prepares these, as he's pulling his runs from one area to another, these actually, these three would actually have a wire nut on here holding all three of them together and the end needs to be taped so nobody will get cut. The reason for putting a wire nut on these three and holding it together is in case somebody on the other end hooks up the wrong line, it becomes energized, this won't be live. It'll actually short itself out. Here, these are hot, they're taped and capped. They should be tucked away in a box like this and out of the way. We don't want anybody to walk by and brush up against them and have one of those nuts fall off and then you'll have a live wire. So again, any any energized wires need to be coiled up and placed in the box and have the junction box cover put over. Okay, ground fault circuit interrupters must be used on all temporary power sources. An extension cord is a temporary cord. On our, on our base building jobs, on our remodeling or our, our repositioning type jobs, when the electrician comes in, he'll have ground faults throughout the property. Those will be designated, we know which ones they are. As we get to the finished part of the phase, we'll have more permanent power. But again, in this situation, in this permanent power, we don't allow you to just plug into the wall. You need to put a GFCI between your extension cord, your vacuum cleaner to, to isolate that source with that ground fault circuit interrupter. All power tools and cords must be inspected daily. All light fixtures must be secured. So you want to inspect your tools daily. You want to make sure all the nuts are right, the water hose is connected properly. You never want to fuel this when it's hot. You want, you want to double check this equipment. Moving into our light fixtures, Whenever we put our light fixtures in and they drop in the top, they need to be wired to the ceiling or to the solid surface decking above. In the event that somebody shakes the ceiling grid, we don't want the lights to fall out and, and crash to the ground. We move it into our incentives. On most of our projects, not most of them, all of our projects that we do do, we give away incentives. We give safety lunches for the entire project. We give away door prizes. We have some good lunches. Some of our projects get the money machine in. It's kind of exciting to see how much they can actually grab, if any at all. So every 30 days on a base building job, we do safety incentive lunches as long as there's no accidents and everything goes well. And 90 days on our interior projects, we do safety lunches, safety breakfasts. Uh, we may have an appreciation day where we find the five or six people that have been doing good all month. We'll bring those guys in and have a lunch for them. So we do different things on the project. We have safety A shirts. There's uh, just gift cards we give out as we go along. So just to show the appreciation of you guys working on our jobs and doing some really great stuff for us and working safe. Each subcontractor is an independent contractor and they're responsible for their own guy's work. Each worker is responsible for his or her own actions. So if, if somebody's not doing right, the foreman needs to step up and remove that guy from the job. If the guy's a safety risk, the foreman needs to send him back to his office and get him retrained or just have him sent back to the office to go work on another project. We, we want to make sure that everybody on our project works safe and they follow our, our guidelines and our protocols. All right, that's all we got. We, we appreciate everything. Uh, there's a sign-in sheet for you on the table.
you flip it over on the back, there's nine questions we want you to answer and then turn it in, put your hard hat sticker on your hat. Again, my phone number's posted in different locations throughout the job site. You ever got any questions, comments, come get me and we'll have a great day. All right, thank y'all very much.